a budget Mac mini. You don't really hear those words very often, budgets and any Apple product, but in today's video, I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step process on how you can get a budget Mac mini working through Hackintoshing. I wanted a machine that I could use for simple purposes, but I also wanted it to be clean and run macOS as well. The first thing that I did was look for a suitable PC to Hackintosh. There are a lot of options out there, but I decided on a Chromebox due to many of them having a similar build style to a real Mac, as well as the process being fairly replicable across all models unlike Office PCs. Chromeboxes are only meant to run Chrome OS, which means that we won't be able to boot UEFI based OSs like Windows or Mac OS. Luckily, Mr. Chromebox has done some fantastic work in this area, and we're actually able to boot UEFI based OSs through his custom firmware. This does mean that you won't be able to boot Chrome OS after flashing his firmware, and if you want to revert back to the old firmware, you'll have to use an EEPROM programmer for that. After flashing the new firmware in Chrome OS, we'll then install Windows, and then we'll create our Hackintosh boot USB install Mac OS, and then we'll have a working Hackintosh. So which Chromebox should you buy? Well, you'll need a Chromebox that is supported by Mr. Chromebox's custom UEFI firmware. This means that you'll need one of the models listed on screen right now. To verify that your Chromebox is supported, go to the chromium.org developer information link in the description below and search for the word in parentheses next to your Chromebox, which is also known as the board name. For example, if you have a Samsung Chromebox Series 3, you would search for Stumpy. Once you've found yours, click on it and under the specifications page, verify that the CPU listed on the website matches the CPU of your Chromebox. If your model is not on screen right now, please do not try this as you will just end up breaking your Chromebox. Please don't ask if your Chromebox is supported. If it's not listed, it's not supported. If it is listed, then it is supported. Although you may have varying luck finding these models, these ones on screen right now are the ones that I found are the most readily available and easiest to find. They will cost you somewhere around $60 to $100, and if you want to go for a higher end one, it'll cost more than that. The other requirement is that you'll need a model with an i3, i5, or i7 in it. Celerons, Pentiums, and Atom chips are not supported at all due to macOS limiting the support of its chips to graphics tier 2 and above, which Celerons, Pentiums, and Atom chips lack. So you'll need to find a model with an i3, i5, or i7 chip. I would also recommend having at least 4GB of RAM, and if you don't have a 64GB drive or larger, I would recommend picking up a non-NVMe M.2 2242 SSD that is 128 gigabytes at minimum. You'll also need an internet connection, preferably via Ethernet, and you'll also need an 8 gigabyte USB drive or larger with a Windows installer on it. The Chromebox that I ended up buying was an ASUS Chromebox CN60 Panther, which came with an i3 4010U, 4 gigabytes of RAM, and a 16 gigabyte SSD. I also bought an 128GB SSD to replace the stock SSD after I flashed the firmware. In terms of I.O., we've got two USB 3.0 ports on the front, an SD card reader and a Kensington lock on the side, and on the back we've got an AC adapter, Realtek Gigabit Ethernet, two more USB 3.0 ports, an HDMI and DisplayPort out, and a headphone combo jack. Now before we get started, I just want to give some pre-warnings to anyone who wants to do this. Firstly, you'll likely be voiding your warranty by disabling Write Protect, and there is a small chance that you could end up breaking your Chromebox. You also won't be able to use Chrome OS once you've flashed the firmware, so if Chrome OS is something that you need, then you won't be able to follow this. Lastly, if you're not willing to put in the work yourself and research a little if something goes wrong, then this guide is not for you. Alright, let's go ahead and get started. Start by disabling Hardware Write Protect on your Chromebox. This is either in the form of a screw on the motherboard or a switch on the motherboard, so do a quick Google search to find out which one it is and how to disable it. Next, put your device into developer mode. Follow the link in the description below and select your model of Chromebox to figure out how to put it into developer mode. For example, on my Chromebox, I have to insert a paper clip and press the recovery button, then power it on and release the button. Once you're in recovery mode, press Ctrl D to enter developer mode, and you may need to confirm it by pressing the recovery button again. Press Ctrl D again, and you'll boot into developer mode.
Before we flash the new firmware, we need to enable USB booting. Open a Chrome tab and press Ctrl Alt F2. When prompted for a login, type Kronos, C H R O N O S, and press Enter. Then type sudo cross system dev underscore boot underscore USB equals one, and then you'll be able to boot off of USB devices. To exit the program, press Ctrl Alt F1. Now let's get to flashing the firmware. You will need to be connected to the internet in order to download the necessary scripts to flash the firmware. Press Ctrl Alt T to enter a cross window. Type shell and then press enter. Next, type the following command on screen, which will download the script which we need to flash the firmware. Then type this command. Finally, type sudo firmware-util.sh and press enter. You should see a screen like this. If hardware write protect is disabled, then the line that says FWWP should say disabled. To flash the firmware, select option 2 and press enter. If it asks you to save the current ROM to a flash drive, you can plug in the flash drive and save the file to a USB drive in case you need to reflash the ROM. I'd highly recommend doing this so that you have a backup in case something goes wrong. Once the flashing is successful, return to the main menu and shut off your Chromebox. We're now ready to upgrade the drive if you have a bigger one or install Windows if you don't. To install Windows, just start up your Chromebox, and if you see some sort of command line, just type exit and hit enter, and then you can navigate to the boot menu and select your USB drive to boot off of. Once you're at the installer, continue and choose the custom install. When you get to a selection with a list of drives, make sure you delete every option until there's only one option that's named unallocated space, then install Windows on it. After Windows is done installing, it will restart on its own. Unplug your USB drive after it shuts down, and then you can continue with the installation of Windows. Okay, so now that we're in Windows, we can begin the regular process of Hackintoshing. To start, we'll need to install Python in order to run some programs. There's a link in the description that you can use to download the latest version of Python. When you install it, make sure that you check Add to the Path. Next, download OpenCore Package from the link in the description below, extract the folder, and navigate to Utilities. Hold Shift and right-click on the Mac Recovery folder, then select Copy as Path. Open a command prompt by typing the Windows key and typing CMD. We're now going to navigate into the Mac Recovery folder and run a program. Type CD and then Space, then Paste and press Enter. This will get us into the Mac Recovery folder. Now, depending on the macOS version that you want to install, you'll type in different things. Follow the link in the description for downloading macOS, then scroll down a little bit until you see some macOS versions and some code. Copy the line of code for the macOS version that you want and paste it into the command line. It will begin to download some necessary files for macOS. While that's downloading, download Rufus from the link in the description below. When you open it, Select the USB drive that you're going to make the installer on, change the boot selection to non-bootable, file system as FAT32, and format. We won't actually be using Rufus for anything other than formatting our drive. After it finishes formatting, open up the USB folder and delete the contents inside. Next, make a new folder called com.apple.recovery.boot. Once the previous files are done downloading, open up OpenCore Package, then Utilities, then Mac Recovery, and you'll see two files that either start with Base System or Recovery Image. Move both into the folder that you just made. Then open the OpenCore Package folder, then X64, and move the EFI folder inside onto your USB stick. The remaining work will be done all inside this folder. Open up the EFI folder, then navigate to OC, then Drivers, and remove everything except for OpenRuntime.EFI. 
Go back to the OC folder and open the Tools folder and remove everything except for OpenShell.efi. Now we'll begin downloading the necessary files to boot macOS. Download hfsplus.efi from the description and move it into the Drivers folder under EFI slash OC. Next, we'll download some Kexts or kernel extensions. These are things that help to facilitate how our hardware is handled in macOS. All of the Kexts are linked in the description below, and all of them need to be put in the EFI slash OC slash Kexts folder on your USB stick. Start with Virtual SMC. This emulates the SMC on real Macs, and it's necessary in order for us to boot. Download the release version, and then move Virtual SMC, SMC Processor, and SMC Super IO into the Kext folder. Next, we'll need to download Lilu. Download the release version and move over the Kext into the Kext folder. We'll also need Whatever Green, which will handle graphics related things for Hackintosh, Apple ALC, which will handle audio, and if you're using a Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Haswell, or Broadwell CPU, you'll need USB Inject All as well. You'll also need an Ethernet Kext, which depends on which type of Ethernet port you have. I have a Realtek Gigabit Ethernet port, so I'll download Realtek RTL8111. I'll leave a link in the description that guides you on which one to choose. Additionally, if you have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, I'll also leave a guide to Kext in the description below. So here's what my Kext folder looks like. Since I'm on a Haswell CPU, I have Apple ALC, Lulu, Realtek RTL8111, SMC Processor, SMC Super IO, USB Inject All, Virtual SMC, and whatever green. We'll also need SSDTs, which patch certain things about our system in order to make them work. The SSDT link in the description will guide you on how to compile each one. If you're on Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge, you need SSDT-EC, and you'll do CPU-PM after you've already installed macOS. If you're on Haswell or Broadwell, you'll need SSDT-Plug and SSDT-EC. If you're on KB Lake, you need SSDT-Plug and SSDT-EC-USBX. Unfortunately, SSDT-Plug likely won't compile on our hardware, so just use the pre-built one that I have linked in the description below. Here, I'm using SSDT-Time to easily compile the SSDTs that I need. All of the SSDTs go in the EFI slash OC slash ACPI folder on your USB stick. Lastly, you'll need to configure your config.plist. This is specific to every generation of CPU, so I will leave a link on how to do it in the description below. When you're choosing your CPU generation, make sure you choose the CPU generation under laptop, not desktop, as many Chromeboxes tend to use mobile hardware, which is not found on desktop PCs. I'd recommend pausing the video and going and doing that, then coming back after you're done, as we do have to change one value. All right, welcome back everyone. If you're done with your config.plist, we're almost ready to boot. We just have to change one thing in the config.plist. Open up your config.plist with proper tree, then navigate to the booter, then quirk section, and change setup virtual map to false. After that, save your config.plist and use the OC Sanity Checker in the description to make sure that your config.plist is all correct. Alright, now we're ready to boot and install macOS. Shut down your Chromebox, and when you turn it back on, press the Escape button to enter the BIOS. Use your arrow keys to navigate down to boot menu, then press enter and use your arrow keys to boot off of your USB stick. When you reach a menu, boot off of the first option. You'll see a bunch of text rolling on the screen, and then you should boot into macOS recovery. We'll first need to erase our drive to install macOS. Begin by opening Disk Utility, then selecting View and then Show All Devices at the top. Next, select the name of your drive and erase the disk. Format it as GUID partition table and APFS. Once it's done erasing, back out of disk utility and continue with the installation. You will need to have an internet connection in order to install macOS. It could take anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours.
Once it's done installing, it will automatically reboot. Boot off of your USB drive again, and this time select macOS installer. It will begin to finish the installation of macOS. Again, it will restart once it is done. Boot off of your USB drive again, and choose macOS installer again. It will then restart a third time afterwards, and this time choose the name of your drive to boot off of. You'll then be able to go through the regular setup like a normal Mac. If Apple ID doesn't work, just skip it for now. It might also be a little laggy during setup, but there's nothing that we can do for now, as we'll have to fix it in macOS. And now we're in macOS. The second to last step is to do frame buffer patching if your iGPU is not working properly. This fixes things related to our integrated GPU and helps with enabling hardware acceleration as well. Follow the guide in the description to do that and come back once you're done. Just a friendly reminder, your config.plist is in your USB stick under EFI slash OC. Now we'll need to move our EFI folder from our USB stick onto our SSD so that way we don't have to continuously use our USB stick to boot. Start by downloading mount EFI and then open mount EFI. If it shows an error about security, open system preferences and then go to security and click open anyway. Choose option B to mount the EFI folder of your SSD, then open Finder and drag the EFI folder from your USB stick onto the EFI partition of your SSD. Once you're done, shut down your PC, unplug your USB stick, and you should be able to boot off of your SSD now. So what works and what doesn't? iServices like iMessage and FaceTime both work, but hardware-based DRM and hardware acceleration do not work for me. Hardware acceleration should theoretically be possible if you have a natively supported macOS iGPU, but unfortunately mine is not natively supported, so I was not able to get hardware acceleration working. Hardware-based DRM also requires a dedicated GPU, so you won't be able to do it with this guide, period. Most Wi-Fi chips won't work, but you'll be able to replace it with a macOS compatible one if you want to. The cheapest Mac Mini that's comparable in performance is the upgraded base model mid-2011 Mac Mini with an i5-2415M, 4GB of RAM, and a 500GB hard drive. The cheapest that I can find them on eBay is for around $175 including tax, about $70 more expensive than my configuration, and the performance of my Hack Mini is not too far behind that of the real Mac Mini. The I.O. ports are also very similar, and the RAM and SSD are much easier to upgrade due to having a wider selection of parts. You also get the faster drive performance from the SSD on the Hack Mini compared to the slower hard drive on the real Mac Mini. And that's it. If you have any trouble, I will leave a link to a Google Doc down in the description below with a bunch of links and guides on Hackintoshing and troubleshooting. Additionally, you can join my Discord and ask me questions there. Alright, good luck Hackintoshing, and don't forget to stay safe.